lifting up Jesus, opening his word from Australia, Denmark, Israel, Japan, New Zealand, Northern Ireland, Republic of Ireland, Singapore, South Africa, United Kingdom, Thailand, the Philippines, United States, and throughout the world. You're watching L'Oreal TV. President Vladimir Putin today unveiled a grand vision for his country's future and what he called the means to achieve it, new nuclear weapons. No one wanted to speak with us constructively. No one has listened to us. You listen to us now. He showed off animations of weapons he called invincible, a hypersonic missile apparently capable of crossing continents in seconds, and a never-before-acknowledged nuclear-powered cruise missile, apparently that can slalom between missile defense systems that Putin considers a long-term threat. It's not clear the weapons even exist, but Putin said he wasn't bluffing. Any use of nuclear weapons against Russia and its allies will be perceived as a nuclear attack on our country. The response will be immediate. Our nuclear triad. Putin's return to Cold War rhetoric comes one month after the U.S. announced its own plans to deploy new nuclear weapons and greater willingness to use nuclear weapons. Putin said he was responding to American threats. The growing military strength of Russia is a secure guarantee of peace because this strength preserves and will always preserve a balance of power in the world. To no surprise, Russian lawmakers responded with praise. They said Putin once again made Russia a global superpower. The theory about Russia as a regional superpower with a weak economy disappears from the American political thinking. The speech took place just over two weeks before the Russian elections. Putin framed the U.S. as an adversary and himself the only leader strong enough to meet the challenge. Hi, this is Tim from Morial TV and Morial Radio here live via Skype with James Jacob Prash in England. And this is This Week in Prophecy. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. Beginning of March 2018, and this is This Week in Prophecy. This Week in Prophecy, Iran has announced it is hosting a major international conference on Holocaust denial and the demise of Israel. It's hearkening back to a prediction made by Iranian leaders that Israel would be gone within 25 years. And it has a figure of a large 25, the digits breaking off and crumbling into pieces is going to be featured as the logo for the conference. Holocaust denial and Israel's demise. Nothing, nothing underscores and highlights the true agenda of Iran other than what it openly and outwardly says. Now, it's frightening that this meant nothing to Barack Obama and John Kerry other than that the United States should help them do it, giving them the $150 billion in unfrozen funds that the Obama administration gave them, that we should be funding it and helping them to destroy Israel. This was Barack Obama. I just think of the stupidity of the liberal American Jewish community and the hypocrisy of the Democratic Party. Why any member of the Jewish community would have anything to do with that terrible party or how they could have supported people like Barack Obama, I don't know. At least Alan Dershowitz admitted he was naive when he saw the antics of Ellis, when he saw the antics of Obama. At least he had the integrity to admit it. There's a delusion with these peoples. The vulgar comedian as her so-called comedian, I don't think she's very funny. I think she substitutes vulgarity for comedies. Sarah Silberman and people like this, they think Obama is some kind of a hero. Uh, you know, they would be wearing a gold star being ushered into a cattle car on the way to Auschwitz, and next to the gold star, they'd have an Obama for president button. That's how stupid these people are. Uh, that is how stupid. It is shocking. They're delusional. Now, this kind of delusion we see in the Jewish community today, not all of it, but so much of it, is no better than the delusion we see among many naive Christians. The Bush family were carried around by the Saudi Arabians in their back pocket after the Saudi Arabians funded 
Al Qaeda after the Saudi Arabians were on back of September 11. All of those terrorists were Saudi Arabian, and they were funded by members of the House of Saud, which is effectively the Saudi government. And Maiv Christians pretended that Saudi Arabia, while it was persecuting Christians, would hang somebody potentially for becoming a Christian or decapitate them. Old man Bush said the Saudis are our friends and there were Christians saying the Bush family are Christians and so forth. Again, the naivety of the church, the naivety of the Jews is incredible. And this kind of undiscerning naivete is what characterized the last days of Judah and the last days of Assyria before the Assyrian and Babylonian captivities. It is amazing how undiscerning and naive the children of God and the people of God can be. Nonetheless, Holocaust rejecting conference celebrating the demise of Israel hosted by Iran this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, the Israeli military chief of staff, General Gadi Eisenkot, flew for high level discussions in Greece with the Greek Defense Ministry and Military High Command. High on the agenda will be the oil and potential <clears throat> oil exploration and natural gas reserves located between Galilee in the Mediterranean and Cyprus. We know Iran working in conjunction with Russia, Syria, and uh, the government of Lebanon has designs in those same fields, although exploration has already begun taking place off the coast of Galilee. We are seeing a rapprochement and a defense cooperation between Israel and Greece. An unspoken aspect of these high-level meetings taking place in Athens between Israel and Greece indisputably is the regime of the Erdogan government in Turkey with its growing Turkish nationalist and Islamist agenda. Many people outside of Greece do not realize that there is an inbred popular resentment of Turkey in Greece because European Turkey, the area of Istanbul or most of Istanbul, not Harem, but across the Bosporus, the European side, Topkopi as it's called, and much of coastal Turkey, including the biblical cities such as Kusidisi, the port of Ephesus, uh, now called Selçuk, the city of Izmir, originally called Smyrna. Uh, those were Greek cities. Those were Greek cities. You also had the Turkish invasion of Cyprus, that although Muslims only constituted 15% of the population of Cyprus, the Turkish government by military force seized 40% of the island. There is a lot of resentment historically by the people of Greece, justifiably, against Turkey. There is also, of course, a resentment against Turkey by the Kurds, who suffered horrifically, and by the victims of the Turkish perpetrated Holocaust, the Armenians, that the Turks have never admitted to, killing perhaps two million innocent people, many women and children among them. There is a lot of opposition to Turkey, and a fair amount of opposition, as we've reported in the past, from Arabs. But with the regime of Tekce Erdogan, it is reaching new highlights and spreading fear among the traditional opponents and enemies of, of, of the Turkish regimes that have been persecuted by the Turks over the last hundred years plus but also in Greece. Hence, although the Greek Orthodox Church has never been particularly amicable to Israel or to Jews, going back to the theology of John Chrysostom, the golden mouth, there is something called real politic. Turkey knows that Israel is the most powerful nation in the Middle East. Greece knows that Israel is the most powerful nation in the Middle East. Turkey and Greece are not friends, even though both are ironically held in NATO by the military and political and economic influence of the United States, the EU, and Britain. Confused situation. 
the grounds for cooperation in the face of the Turkish threat as it is perceived between Israel and Greece are obvious. Turkey was again the motivating force on back of the so-called sea lifts, attempting to bring in people who were inimical to Israel and to Gaza that was blockaded by the Israeli military. There are problems here, major problems, and it becomes a very difficult juggling act for the United States, for the high command of NATO, and as well as for the governments of Turkey, Israel, and Greece themselves. Continue to watch this, but there has been a significant development in this situation this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was disclosed by various intelligence sources and confirmed, in effect, by the United States and by Israel that North Korean missile experts and chemical warfare experts have come to and have been somewhat active in Syria. The Syrian government is denying this, as are the Russians. But without doubt, it is taking place not by North Korean military personnel or government employees, but by front companies operating much the way that Russia does, the United States does, and other countries do when they carry on covert intelligence and military operations. We have North Korean footprints in Syria. We've reported this before, but this week we have additional confirmation that it is and has been going on, but specifically in the area of missile technology and biological and chemical weapons. Mr. Putin's Russian government this week in prophecy has asserted that the United States is operating in conjunction with Kurdish forces, that is largely the Syrian Democratic Army, 20 military bases with U.S. military personnel in Syria, again, in collaboration with the Kurds. We have repeatedly stated that the Kurds are the only Iraqis that it's possible to trust at all. But of course, they are the only Syrians it's really possible to trust at all. You do have anti-Assad Syrians, but many of those are friends with ISIS or are ISIS. The Kurds, however, are the one people group in both Syria and Iraq that there is some basis to deal with. The Russians well know this. In addition to the Russian displeasure of American cooperation with the Kurds, we have the ongoing saga of Turkish displeasure of American cooperation with the Kurds, as we've been reporting over recent weeks. Again, a very complex, if not confusing, situation. Mr. Putin is plainly disturbed as further reports continue to emanate from Russia on higher than initially reported casualty statistics of employees of the Wagner PLC, the Russian front group, employing former Russian Spaznats commandos in a civilian mercenary capacity that were killed by American artillery, drone, helicopter, Apache helicopter, and airstrikes two and a half weeks ago. Plainly, there's more going on in Russia. We reported last week about the Russian deployment of upgraded Sukhoi aircraft, but it continues to develop and unfold this week in prophecy. It was announced by the British Foreign Office this week in prophecy that Prince William, who will not be accompanied by his wife, Katie, who's expecting a baby, will be visiting Israel, Jordan, and the West Bank this week in prophecy. These visits, or royal visits, normally take place at the behest of the British Home Office and Number 10 Downing Street for political purposes, where the royal family serve the interests of British diplomacy. Plainly, Theresa May is trying to smooth over the damage done to the British standing in the Middle East concerning her actions in voting against Israel at the behest of Barack Obama and the UNESCO vote. 
discounting any legitimacy to Jewish claims over biblical holy sites in Jerusalem and vicinity. There have been other miscalculated British diplomatic policies in the Middle East, and they are not in the best terms with either the Palestinian Arabs or with the Israelis. Additionally, Britain continues to have to cooperate with the United States that has relocated its embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem, at least expressing its intentions to do so in the near future. Thus, a royal visit is on the cards and it will be taking place this summer. Britain continues to be an important factor in Middle East relationships. Let us remember that it was the sykes picart Agreement in the aftermath of the First World War that created the Middle East as we know it, when the British and French essentially decided how to carve up the Ottoman Empire when the Turkish Ottomans were aligned with Turkey, following the victories of General Allenby and so forth in Beersheba and Jerusalem. After the disaster at Gallipoli, the British and Anza's forces fought back tremendously. We had the power play of uniting Arabs to fight the Turks under Lawrence of Arabia, T.E. Lawrence. And in the aftermath of the First World War, the entire map of the Middle East had to be withdrawn with Turkey being sequestered away from its Ottoman grandeur. Something that Mr. Erdogan is committed to trying to resurrect. It was Britain who created Jordan, the Hashemite kingdom. It was Britain who created Iraq. It was the French who created Syria and Lebanon in their present form. We need to understand these things. Memories in the Middle East, particularly among Arabs, run very, very long. This particular royal visit cannot just be seen as a modern episode. It's tied to a string of historical realities dating back 100 years. Certainly, that comes into play in the thinking of the British government and of the governments of the Arab countries of the Middle East, as well as the Israelis. But it has been announced there will be a royal visit this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy in Israel, the judge who had been presiding over procedures related to the threatened indictment of Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu, that is Judge Ronit Posansky Katz, has been suspended and will face a judicial trial of her own. She was suspended by the Justice Minister Ayelet Shaked and by the President of the Israeli Supreme Court Esther Havat, two other women. There has been a lot of corruption, interestingly, in attempts to oust Mr. Netanyahu by legal and prosecutorial means. Again, this exactly parallels what is taking place in the United States with Mr. Trump. Unable to defeat him electorally at the ballot box, his political opponents have fabricated allegations of Russian collusion or his collusion with Russia, of charging him with crimes that are not crimes, and of conspiracy to obstruct justice with no crime committed in a politically motivated witch hunt, which even Alan Dershowitz, professor emeritus of Harvard, constitutional lawyer, and a liberal Democrat admitted, as have various other Democrats. No evidence has come to play against Mr. Trump, and the evidence against Mr. Netanyahu is again shallow. But as we've seen corruption in the FISA court system and within the Justice Department in the United States and the FBI in this politically motivated campaign to attack the Trump administration because they're unable to defeat him by democratic electoral means, so the same is now taking place in Israel. It's a remarkable parallelism the very judge herself is now in very serious trouble. Reacting again to the American counterattacks on Russian, Iranian, and Assad forces on the banks of the Euphrates, in which almost certainly 
scores of Russian former Spaznets were killed. Mr. Putin has announced a essential return to the Cold War. He has said that there are new stealth weapons being unveiled in the Soviet arsenal this week in prophecy. He pointed to a cruise missile which he claims is capable of evading any anti-ballistic missile system. He also unveiled an underwater drone that is capable of hitting aircraft carriers at some distance, and also a new ICBM called the Samat. The remarkable return to the Cold War footage of Mr. Putin is a self-destructive exercise in mania. When he had the Iron Curtain, when countries like Poland and Hungary and the Ukraine were under his domain, when the Baltic countries, such as Lithuania, or the Balkan countries, such as Bulgaria, were under Soviet control, even then he was contained. Now the most advanced NATO post in Eastern Europe is less than six hours drive from Moscow, and his army is much smaller. Furthermore, countries like Romania, Poland, Hungary, Lithuania dislike and resent Russia because of the former Soviet occupation. What they suffered of the communist brutality when they were finally liberated by the collapse of the Iron Curtain following the American counter deployment of cruise missiles, thanks largely to Mrs. Thatcher, Mr. Reagan, and even Mr. Carter in response to the Soviet deployment of the SS 20. That was the beginning of the end of the Soviet military dominance in Eastern Europe. But now Mr. Putin has returned to that same footage, only on much weaker ground. As we have reported, he has missed every opportunity to bring economic stability to Russia and a genuine security. We've had atrocious Islamic terror attacks in St. Petersburg, in Moscow, in the stadium, in the theater, We've had the murder of the Russian Ussetian children in Chechnya. We've had the debacle of Chechnya. All of these major threats to Russia's very existence, with Islam a growing threat demographically to the majority of the demographic population of Russia being Russian. Yet, he panders to Islamic forces in Iran and in Syria in order to secure what he thinks are better oil interests and natural gas interests for himself. When oil and natural gas were at higher prices, particularly oil, instead of investing in economic diversification, as we pointed out, he invested in resurrecting a war machine. This was the very kind of economic policy that undermined the Soviet Union. They built a humongous war machine without a good enough economic base to sustain it and were defeated by the West in that process, even though at substantial costs to the West, particularly the United States. Nonetheless, he's doing it again. It has been said the definition of insanity is to do the same thing repeatedly and expect a better result. The man seems to be suffering from insanity by that definition. He himself faces a very real radical Islamic threat. The oil weapon, as he has once known it, is gone. He wants to see the future of Russia under his policies. All he needs to do is look at Venezuela. Russia is heading the same way. But in his desperation and his expansionism into the Middle East, he's going back into a Cold War footage. The people of Poland, Lithuania, Romania, Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Slovakia, Hungary, they've had enough of this. The Ukrainians have had enough of this. The Latvians have had enough of this. The Estonians have had enough of this. They've had enough. So have the East Germans. They've had enough. This man is going to bring about a situation 
of social, political, and economic desperation in Russia. Now, when megalomaniac dictators, and that's what he is, despite the nominal presence of a Russian democracy, the Russia is always going to be ruled by a czar. Doesn't matter if you call him a czar or a commissar or a Putin. Despite the masquerades, he is bringing about an economic crisis in Russia that will have social and political ramifications. When people like him, dictatorial people like him, become desperate, desperate people do desperate things. Again, we are not saying it predictively, but it is easy to see how this could provide an impetus for a Gog and Magog scenario. But it is gaining, again, further leverage in the control of events and Russia's participation in them this week in prophecy. Let us continue. It has been reported that there have been further chemical weapons attacks in Syria. In Syria, the Assad regime has ignored a UN ceasefire declared Saturday. In fact, there's evidence of a new gas attack outside the capital. Charlie Daggett tonight has the latest on this. On the second day of the ceasefire, airstrikes and missiles continued to pound Ghouta. The bombing has been strongly condemned around the world, but the Syrian regime and their Russian allies seem deaf to the criticism. The famed White Helmets civilian rescue teams worked frantically to save who they could. And medics today said they treated children who showed symptoms consistent with a chlorine gas attack. We've been keeping in touch with the family of 10-year-old Noor and her 8-year-old sister Ala. She suffered a gash on her forehead last week when a piece of shrapnel from a nearby explosion tore into their living room. We were very terrified and scared. You can't imagine the life here. Today, we spoke with their mother, Shamsa Khatib. Have you seen any change since the ceasefire was announced? The both planes target us again. So there were more airstrikes. Yeah, and bombs. Uh, more than 20 bombs. Activists say more than 500 people have been killed since the bombing started. The Russians say the ceasefire doesn't apply to the targeting of those they consider terrorists. That's no solace to the residents still trapped there. Charlie Daggett, CBS News, London. Chlorine gas attacks on the outskirts of Damascus in East Gauta. These are being denied again by Russia and by the Assad regime, but the reports continue to arrive outside of Syria that it's happening. Once more, Assad is desperate. Desperate people do desperate things. Syria no longer exists. You have areas of rebel, Turkish, and American control, as well as Assad's control, which is not really Assad. It is Iran and Russia. He is simply a little puppet now. He's no longer the president of Assyria in anything except name. The Syrian government is controlled by Iran in some collusion with Russia. This is the reality. When he almost was toppled, he resorted to chemical and biological weapons. Barack Obama drew a proverbial red line and said, don't cross it, don't use these weapons of mass destruction. Barack Obama failed to keep his word, proving that he was a weak leader to Mr. Putin and to Mr. Assad. They knew America would not do anything with a weak and unqualified and unfit commander in chief like Barack Obama, whose foreign policy agenda was kneeling down and licking the boots of Iran in public, together with John Kerry. With Mr. Trump, it became different. When these weapons were again threatened for use, Mr. Trump had cruise missile attacks launched from American destroyers in the Mediterranean, taking out Syrian bases where the weapons of mass destruction were stored. Nonetheless, we have reports that they've been used again this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was disclosed to the media by the Pentagon and by the Israeli government that Iran is operating 
a fully active missile, missile base on the outskirts of Damascus. This completely proves to be nothing less than a blatant lie concerning the claims made by Iran only one week ago that its military presence in Syria was to oppose terror. You do not need a medium-range missile base to fight terrorists or to fight ISIS. You need a medium-range missile base to attack an enemy that's within medium range. There is only one enemy that could be, and that enemy is, of course, Israel. More to this in a moment. But we have out-and-out out proof, out-and-out out proof that Iran lied, and lied they did. Let us pray that Mr. Trump makes the right decision and not renews Obama's illegal treaty with Iran. It should not be extended anymore. Iran has been in repeated violation, both of letter and of spirit. And they continue to lie and continue to state their agenda of obliterating their enemies, especially Israel. But let's move further. It was reported in the press that there may be an upheaval going on in the U.S. State Department. In the aftermath of the Second World War, American diplomacy in the Middle East was largely controlled by a group of former academics known as Arabists, who had infatuations with Arab language, history, and culture. They made most of American policy. While I did not like him personally, Mr. Truman went against the Arabists when he gave recognition to Israel as a nation following the United Nations vote when America voted for the reestablishment of the Jewish state. The Arabists, by the 1960s and in the aftermath of the Six-Day War, were replaced by people known as processists, who were to some degree Arabists with a different name. Unlike the Arabists, they were not from an academic or cultural background, but they were from the world of diplomacy. These were the people who came into prominence around the time of Camp David, achieving some good at certain points, but have since pursued the traditional Arabist agenda, the old one, that Israel was the belligerent party. Now, of course, we know that this is an absolute lie. Jimmy Carter, by any barometer of history, has been a failed president. He's a man who has failed at everything he ever did. He failed as a peanut farmer and a businessman. When he got in trouble, it was Muslim oil money from the Middle East who bailed him out. He's bought and paid for it. That explains his book, why he's become an apologist for terror in his old age, why he's so anti-Israel. But he was humiliated, humiliated by Iran. And his name became synonymous, emblematic of perceived American weakness when the American hostages were held. This was Jimmy Carter, the president of double-digit inflation, etc. He's failed at everything he ever did. He was a member of David Rockefeller's Trilateral Commission. Some said David Rockefeller's left-hand man. But from business to the economy to foreign relations, he failed at everything, although he does have partial credit for two things, one of which is Camp David, and the other of which is joining with Mrs. Thatcher in pushing for the deployment of cruise missiles in response to the Soviet SS-20 buildup that we've already mentioned, dating back to the 1970s. And he reacted to the Soviet invasion of Afghanistan with some degree of stamina. But he was largely seen as a weak president, certainly throughout the Muslim world. He was a picture of American weakness, or at least a perceived weakness. This was him. When Ehud Barak offered a compromise on Jerusalem, an Israeli withdrawal of the West Bank except for 3% of the land where there were Jewish settlements on biblical sites, willing to give a Palestinian Arab Muslim state, 3% equivalent of Israeli land in return for it. Perfectly acceptable to the Clinton administration, perfectly acceptable to the Israelis, 
and at one point acceptable to most Arabs, certainly acceptable to the moderate Arab states and to Jordan and to Egypt. Let's remember, it was Jimmy Carter who turned against Clinton and urged Arafat not to accept a two-state solution, as they called it. They were offered a two-state solution, not for the only time. It happened two other occasions. But they were given a firm, solid offer, a compromise on Jerusalem with the capital of a Palestinian Muslim Arab state in East Jerusalem, a withdrawal of all Israeli presence from the West Bank except for 3%, for which they would be given an equivalent amount of land from Israel proper. Everybody would have been happy. Everyone would have gotten what they said they wanted, except for terrorist groups like Hamas and Hezbollah. It was Jimmy Carter who told Arafat not to take it. Arafat instead unleashed a jihad with bombings of bus stops and of school buses and of restaurants, forcing the Israelis to build a fence and in certain places a wall where the Muslim extremists were shooting at school buses and motorists on their way to work inside Israel proper from the other side of the divide. This was Jimmy Carter. That's his true legacy. This is a shameful and a despicable man. Not only is he a failure, a political failure, a failed businessman, a failed everything, but he bears partial responsibility for the reason that there was no peace and is no peace in the Middle East, and he bears partial responsibility for Arafat resorting to the reign of terror bombing that Arafat did. Thousands of people, thousands were killed. Jimmy Carter had no problem. In fact, it was Jimmy Carter who attended a segregated Southern Baptist church up until the time he was elected president, his church remained segregated. They wouldn't let black people in. Jimmy Carter called Mormons Christians and said it's arrogant for evangelicals to evangelize Mormons. There's much we can say about it. Yet it was Jimmy Carter who made the term born again a household term when he was elected president. But let's look at what he's done. And look what he is doing. He's condemned every other president, including Democrats, for a job he was proven and proved himself to be completely incapable of doing himself. It is a frightening situation, a frightening situation indeed. He was the king of the processists. But now, with the new American ambassador, a change may be taking place within the State Department, particularly in view of the Trump administration's relocation of the American embassy, keeping its promise to Jerusalem. The new American ambassador has asked that the United States State Department cease using the term occupied territories and referring to the West Bank. And he is correct. The actual legal and diplomatic term should be disputed territories. The dispute between the Palestinian Arabs who live there and the indigenous people who come from there, the Jews. It's a disputed territory. It should be referred to as disputed territory, it's not occupied, or simply be referred to geographically as the West Bank. Now these things represent a setback for the entrenched processists and their Arabist predecessors within the State Department bureaucracy. If there was ever a department of the federal government that needs a house cleaning, in fact, it needs to be gutted and rebuilt, it's the State Department bureaucracy. But this week in prophecy, things may be beginning to change. It was announced last week that the relocation of the embassy would take place sooner than expected, most probably in the existing diplomatic facility across the street from the Gan Atzma'ut, the Independence Park in central Jerusalem, until the possibility of a larger embassy can be built. It will be over with very, very quickly. But also this week in prophecy, this very week, it was publicly disclosed that there are moves afoot 
to consider the proposals by the American ambassador to Israel to cease using the term occupied in reference to the West Bank territories that are disputed this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, let us look at our persecution index. In Lahore, Pakistan, the cousin of the Christian youth we were reported on last week on This Week in Prophecy, was arrested, I suppose, for the crime of being the cousin of the falsely accused Christian. He was forced by the Islamic Pakistani police to engage in sexual acts of a perverted and unnatural nature. Expect nothing to happen. But this is what they do to Christians in so many Muslim countries, and then make themselves out to be the victims when somebody stands up to them. We reported last week that there was a rescue of a number of Christian girls who were abducted, kidnapped by Boko Haram in Nigeria. Last Sunday, however, there are reports coming out of northern Nigeria that perhaps as many as 100 further Christian girls have been abducted. We pray for their rescue or for their release. We also pray that as ISIS has been nearly totally destroyed, Boko Haram will be totally destroyed also. It is a very evil and a very dangerous organization. But it's happening again this very week. And so it continues. The Trump administration finds itself in something of a dilemma. We reported last week about the plight, the status of 100 Christian refugees from Iran who are given a certain amount of time to leave Austria, in which they have only approximately one week left. They were denied visas to answer to, they were denied visas, sorry, they were denied visas, as we reported, to enter the United States. Now a delegation of both Democrat and Republican members of Congress on a bipartisan effort have approached Vice President Pence asking him to reconsider allowing these refugees to enter the United States. Hypocritically, the British government of Theresa May has not allowed them into Great Britain either, yet they have generously accepted even radical Muslims as refugees but not Christian ones. This is Her Majesty's government, both of the Liberal and the Conservative Party as it stands now in Great Britain. The dilemma facing the Trump administration is this. There are efforts to repeal the Frank Lauterberg program, named after former U.S. Senator from New Jersey, that would allow religious refugees who are being persecuted into the United States on an emergency basis. The problem that the Trump administration is facing with the Frank Lautenberg program, which was passed for good humanitarian reasons, and of which various religious refugees, including Christians, Jews, and others, have benefited, is that one cannot discriminate against any one particular religion or faith on the basis of it. And the fear being that radical Islamists will misuse it to enter the United States. How do you keep radical Islamists out unless you co-equally keep others out? We can understand the motivations and the problems legally and politically the Trump administration is facing. There are good reasons to want to suspend or terminate the Lautenberg program. The problem is, what do you do with people who actually need to escape persecution. These people have approximately one week left in Austria before they are forced to leave with the possibility of returning to Iran to face arrest and persecution. This bipartisan committee of Democrats and Republicans have approached Mr. Pence and asked for asylum for these people. Let's pray that there'll be a way found to give them refugee status in the United States. Again, the British government, while more than happy so often 
to accept even radical Muslims as asylum seekers and refugees readily turns their backs on Christians. Hence, Great Britain does not appear to be much of an option. May the Lord intervene in this situation on behalf of our brethren. And may Mr. Pence, who is a believer, come to some terms on behalf of these Christians from Iran. The Malaysian High Court has declared that Sharia courts, Islamic religious courts, will have final jurisdiction over Christian conversion to Islam, dictating that Christians cannot legally convert to Islam. Now, that has effectively been the law already. Christians have been arrested for becoming Christians, yet people pretend that Malaysia is a free and happy country. In fact, apart from the oil, it is largely the Chinese Christian business community and professional community who are a minority, and the Indian community, some of whom are Christians, others Hindus, who run the economy and make Malaysia prosperous apart from the oil, as in the Petronas Towers, etc. You have a 60% Malaysian Muslim majority, 60%. They control the country demographically, and they control the military. They are not kind to Christians, but it is an apartheid government, an apartheid Islamic government. If you are Chinese, an ethnic Chinese, or if you are an Indian, or if you are a Christian, you must go to university in Australia, New Zealand, the United States. You can't get a place in a university in most cases. They will give it to an underqualified or a less qualified or even an unqualified Muslim based on religion and race in their apartheid system. Yet where you have a real actual apartheid government, the Muslim world says nothing. There's no boycott and disinvestment movement concerning Malaysia where there is real apartheid. But in Israel, where 22% of the students in Israeli universities are Arab, we have repeatedly fed the lie that Israel is apartheid when it plainly isn't. And they're receiving subsidized educations. Additionally, they can vote. They can be members of the Israeli Knesset, the parliament. But there is a boycott and disinvestment campaign organized by the Islamic world against Israel for being apartheid when it isn't, when an apartheid Muslim state is given carte blanche to do what it wishes. Again, this transpires continually. And that is this week's persecution index. This week in prophecy, President Trump has announced his intention to run for the presidency again, rerun in 2020, appointing a very apt, apparently, quite skilled campaign manager. He's moving forward with his agenda very rapidly, by and large, apart from his inaction on the deficits. There is controversy surrounding his reaction to the Parkland shootings. It is comments concerning the NRA. Not everybody from his base is happy, but they're a lot happier than they would be had Hillary Clinton been reelected for what would have amounted to a third term of Barack Obama or something worse conceivably. He will be running again. Again, we pray that God will guide him in his decisions and in his governance, that the Lord will protect him, and that the anti-Christian forces, the pro-abortion, pro-death forces, the pro-same-sex marriage forces, and the general left will be thwarted in their efforts and their campaigns of lies, slander, and defamation. We also pray that there will be justice concerning the corruption in the FBI and the Justice Department. Nonetheless, he announced his intentions to run. Daniel tells us it is the Lord who establishes kings and removes them. He has established President Trump and Mr. Pence at this time. Let us continue to pray for them. At the same time, there is gross dissatisfaction among the rank and file in the Tory or Conservative Party in Great Britain with Theresa May for good reason. That woman has been a 
cataclysmic failure on everything she has done. Foreign policy, Brexit negotiations, her relationship with the United States, it has been dismal, if not abysmal. There are moves afoot to remove her. Many people would like to see the Roman Catholic again, James Reese Mogg, replace her. It is crucial that Jeremy Corbyn not become prime minister of Great Britain. The Labour Party has moved to the extreme left, as has the Democratic Party in the United States, only more so. His campaign is saturated with anti-Semitism. He himself is believed by many people to be a vehement anti-Semite, certainly an opponent of Israel. But this week in Prophecy, it was announced that there are allegations by former agents of then-communist Warsaw Pact intelligence agents from Czechoslovakia, a surrogate agency of the KGB out of Russia, that he was a agent or informant, together with the person the Britons known as Red Ken, former London mayor Ken Livingston, of Soviet intelligence with Czechoslovakian handlers. There are questions to be answered. He, of course, denies these things, but the agent in question says he was the handler, and he is standing by his charges. If these charges can be shown to be true, it may spell the end of him politically. He admits having met with them, apparently, repeatedly. And the classified intelligence shows that he was tapped as a potential source who knew intelligence information. This is disputed, however, by the Labour Party, saying he was merely a backbencher who did not have very much access to anything of a classified nature. It is an ongoing battle, but an interesting one. But it's taking place, and it's taking place this week. Let's move on. The main news for this week. Again, something being grossly underreported by the mainstream press. For the second time, the Prime Minister of Lebanon, Saad Hariri, who was a Saudi citizen, dual national, has been summoned to the Ad, the Saudi capital, to meet with Prince Mohammed bin Salman. The previous time, approximately five months ago he was summoned, he had assets seized and was almost nearly not allowed to leave the country and return to Lebanon. He's been summoned again. The reason being, he has switched allegiances and is now politically aligning himself with Hezbollah, that is, effectively, Iran and Syria, and the parties supporting them in the upcoming Lebanese elections. The Shia alliance has an electoral majority, not by itself, but with its coalition partners. It is controlled from Iran. Its linchpin is Hezbollah. Last week, we reported that Iranian Revolutionary Guard commanders were seen in southern Lebanon observing rocket launching positions close to the border with Israel, situated to attack Galilee with 150,000 rockets, missiles, and projectiles, not all of them mere katushas, many of them larger that can reach anywhere in Israel. The bubbling threat that we've warned about is Iranian influence has grown in Gaza with Hamas and a two-front attack from Gaza and from southern Lebanon concurrently can spin the Middle East into a horrific war in which Israel would be forced to take massive, massive action, at least as far north as the Latani River in southern Lebanon, if not to Tyre and Sudan, and also attack Beirut itself, as well as invading Gaza, potentially. This is a very real possibility. Now, when we look at this in concert with what's happening in Syria, where we have Iranian, Iranian positions 40 to 50 kilometers 
from the Golan Heights and the Israeli border, where we have Iranian mid-range missiles now deployed on Syrian territory pointed at Israel. And we have Russian military advisors helping to coordinate and facilitate what's happening in Syria. We see the tentacles of Iran attempting to surround Israel from Israel's southwest, north, and northeast. This is a powder cake. It would appear to make a war in the near future almost inevitable. Am I saying it's going to be Gog and Magog? No, I cannot say it's going to be Gog and Magog, although it may be a prelude to it. But neither can I say it wouldn't be a Gog and Magog. What I can say is there's a very dangerous powder cake involving Iran, Syria, Hezbollah, and Hamas. And now that the Lebanese government has tipped its hand towards Iran, away from the Saudi influence that is closer to the interests of the United States and the West, things are becoming increasingly intensified. Again, this is a major, major development this week in prophecy. And there is very, very little attention being given to it in the mainstream media, at least thus far. But it's happening. Watch Lebanon. Watch what happens with the Hariri government. 150,000 rockets facing Israel. There is no place in Israel that would be immune, that would be out of rocket range. No place. This could be quite notorious. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu took to Twitter to explain why he went to Moscow and met with Putin. I just finished good and intensive talks with Russian President Vladimir Putin. I told him Israel views seriously two developments. First, Iran's attempt to establish itself militarily in Syria. The second, Israel's attempt to create in Lebanon precise weaponry to be used against Israel. I made it clear to him we won't agree to any one of these developments and we will act as needed. Netanyahu's meeting was followed up by an article by an Israeli general. He said Iran is turning Lebanon into one big missile factory while the international community looks the other way and warned the people of Lebanon they've become pawns in the hands of Iran. He wrote the ordinary citizen will be mistaken to think that this process turns Lebanon into a fortress. It is nothing more than a barrel of gunpowder on which he, his family and his property are sitting. One in every three or four houses in southern Lebanon is a headquarters, a post, a weapons depot, or a Hezbollah hideout. We know these assets and know how to attack them accurately if required. Right now, uh, you know, Lebanon is effectively a fully owned franchise of Islamic Republic of Iran. Many Mideast observers like Jonathan Spire, the author of Days of the Fall, a reporter's journey in the Syria and Iraq wars, feel that Lebanon no longer controls its own destiny. What it confirms is just the extent to which today uh, Hezbollah and the other clients of uh, Iran have effectively swallowed up Lebanon. That's to say, from originally constituting a kind of state within a state in Lebanon, they have now, as of, of recent months, effectively swallowed up the real state. The General's article is just one of the latest warnings by Israel that the next war with Hezbollah will not be like the last one. This won't be like it was in 2006, a little kind of border skirmish or series of skirmishes between the Israel Defense Forces and Hezbollah. No, this will have the dimensions of a state-to-state -state conflict. From Israel's point of view, Hezbollah and Lebanon today are the same thing. And if war comes again, therefore, it will be a war between the state of Israel and the state of Lebanon this time around. It remains to be seen if Lebanon, Russia, and the international community will heed the warnings by Israel. Chris Mitchell, CBN News, Jerusalem. And it's taking shape this week in prophecy. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. Finally, this week in prophecy, something that some would describe as half hearted. Justin Welby, not a conservative Christian by any means, pro-homosexual agenda, and pro a lot of other things, has decreed publicly 
that Sharia must not become part of British law. It's interesting he said that, and it's only God's grace he did say it. He's been described as the church mouse that roared by Melanie Phillips, the journalist, great journalist, friend of evangelicals, unsaved Jewish woman, may the Lord save her. But it's interesting that he said it. It does show that there is a growing awareness in Britain following the Islamic terrorist attacks in Manchester and London that things cannot continue as they are. May more people in Britain and continental Europe wake up to the reality of the radical Islamic threat for what it is. And may the Lord deal with the friends of these people who are threatening Europe's welfare. I, of course, speak of Angela Merkel. Now, it's not my place to campaign politically for or against anybody. But I do know what happens to Christians in Muslim countries, and I do know what the Muslims want to do to the Christians in so-called Christian countries. A showdown is coming. There was a showdown with Islam in the 16th century between Jan Sobieski, the Polish king who saved Central and Eastern Europe from the Islamic invasion. There was a showdown with Charles Martel in France and against the Saracens. There was a showdown in Spain with Ferdinand and Isabella against the Moors. There was a showdown between the Khazar Empire, whose leaders and kings converted to Judaism, in the Caucasus and Islam. These showdowns have happened before, but one is taking shape again. And as we see, it is taking shape this week in prophecy. My name is James Jacob Prash. Thank you so much for listening. God bless and have a very good week. Mm-hmm.